This is Learn From Others, where we interview a cross-section of successful individuals so you can learn from their experiences, achievements, and even their mistakes. We ask four questions that will educate and inspire. Greg Stanley will be your guide as we join our guests on a journey from adolescent daydreaming to success in today's world. Join us on this adventure as we learn from others together. Well, welcome to Learn From Others, where we help others succeed by sharing success. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest today, Chad Allen. Chad, thank you for taking us on your career journey. Oh, I'm excited about this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Well, before we find out what you're actually doing today, let's start at the very beginning. And could you please tell us, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be an astronaut. Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) You're my first astronaut. That's great. It's true. That's what I wanted to be. What started that? I was just always fascinated with space travel. And, uh, you know, my stepfather, who I lived with from the time I was about four years old, uh, worked in the Air Force. So I'm sure that, you know, sort of air travel was in the air in our in our home. And I remember, I remember them going to some sort of a cocktail. My parents went to some sort of cocktail greeting an astronaut, and my mom brought home the astronaut's autograph. I have no idea who who it was now. <laughs> right. Uh, I remember we had pictures in my in my childhood bedroom of like planets and uh, you know the solar system and constellations and and all that sort of thing. So I it just it was in the air, and I was fascinated with it. I'm still kind of fascinated with with space and. Um, you know, because space travel today being spearheaded by people like Jeff, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, I mean, it's, it's still just as fascinating as ever to me. Well, now, what was one of your favorite subjects or hobbies in school? I uh, have always been interested in uh, writing and literature. I was also very interested in drama. I was the drama club president two years in a row. Wow. Uh, at my high at my high school. So so when I went into college, actually, my first major uh, was drama and then eventually transitioned into just English as as my major. Uh, but I've always been kind of a, a humanities guy. I've never I mean, I, I remember enjoying physics and math, but just not being that good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way. I was I loved math until I hit calculus and that's when I or pre or AP calculus or something and then I hit the wall. I was done. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. Well, what was one of your first jobs you had where you felt like you had some responsibilities and earned a paycheck? So, my mom um would farm me out as a babysitter to her friends. So, <laughs> uh so that's the first job that comes to mind where I actually received a check for services rendered. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that's the first one that comes to mind. Did your mom take uh, a cut since she was farming you out, or did she let you have all of it? No, uh, she let me have all of it. She's oh, that's good. That way. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what was your first job where you uh, had a W-2, like your first official job? I did drywalling in college as a way to you know, have some spending money. I hung drywall and did the the mudding and the taping and all of that. And I remember texturing ceilings and all that kind of work. It was messy, uh, very physical work, but it it helped me out when I was in college. Now that's great. Have you done any drywalling, mudding, or texturing of ceilings in the last ten years? I have. I have certainly done my fair share of repairing walls <laughs> before painting them, you know, like a little right. spackling or a little mudding. But apart from that, nah, not, not very much. All right. Okay. Well, cool. Well, now we know how you started, wanted to maybe be an astronaut, learned a little bit about your first job. So if you would, tell us, what do you do today? Today, I work for myself as a full-time writing coach. And the way I got there is I worked for 20 years in the book publishing industry in the editorial department. I started as a, what at our company was called a project editor, overseeing the copy editing and proofreading processes. A few years in, I became an acquisitions editor. Acquisitions editors, their job is to bring books under contract. So they talk with authors and literary agents, and they pitch books to book publishers, and they try to get the you know, they try to get everybody happy so that the 
author will sign the contract, the publisher will sign the contract, and okay, now we have a deal, we're going to bring this book to market. That's an acquisitions editor. I did that for uh, well over a decade, and then the last seven years in that career, I was the editorial director for a, a publishing division. So acquisitions editors reported to me. I still did some acquiring, but in addition to that, I led a team, and we uh, we talked. I, I, my job was more about the strategy and the vision for this particular division of the company. And we published uh, 60 to 70 books a year inside this division. And so I loved that work. I, it was it was thrilling to work with authors and bring books into the marketplace. But there was this underbelly to my job that really started to bother me. After a while, I would regularly get book proposals from writers whose passion was sort of embodied in this proposal that they sent in for review. Mm -hmm. And every week I, I was sending out a rejection email, you know, and I was polite about it, but it was essentially, sorry, this isn't a good fit, you know, good luck. And right. I kept sending this out and sending this out, and it really started to bother me. About six years ago, I started blogging because I thought, you know, I, I have some things to say that I think could help writers. And so I started blogging about writing and publishing and building an audience. And that kind of took on a life of its own until I, uh, a friend of mine said, you know what, if you could talk me through how to write a book proposal, that would be amazing. And then by that point, I'd reviewed thousands of book proposals. And so I created this course called Book Proposal Academy. It's 35 videos, and it just walks people through the process of crafting a powerful book proposal. I released that, I don't know, three, two or three years ago, and a lot of people have used it and gotten book deals because of it. And so that's what I mean. It kind of took on a life of its own until I decided, all right, this is a sustainable enough business that I'd at least like to give it a shot full time. So about nine months ago, I made the transition to full-time writing coach, and I sell that course, and I do some one-on-one -on -one work with writers, and I have a little membership community called Book Camp where I help people. So that's what I do full-time now. Well, that's really great, and I love the way you outlined your career. Let me see if I got this correct, so correct me where you need to. <laughs> your first job, yeah. you kind of started out with the nuts and bolts as an editor, how to craft a book. The next level... Yeah. You took that product, and then you would package it for a publisher. And then the next level, you were managing the folks that were kind of doing that role. So it seemed like you, you were learning and growing and increasing responsibilities. And then you made the transition when you realized, hey, this is rough. You know, sending out all these rejection letters for folks to have a true passion for what they're doing. And you decided right. to say, hey, instead of writing rejection letters, I'm going to find a form in which I can help them succeed yeah. at what they want to do. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, going back to the beginning, of my career, I would say the distinction between a, a project editor and an acquisitions editor is whereas a project editor's main responsibility is making the manuscript as good as it can possibly be, you know, working with the author, the main role of an acquisitions editor is to, is to acquire books for a book publisher. So gotcha. they're, okay. they're, really, they're really quite different uh, roles. I guess the the commonality between them is you you know in both roles you have to know what a good book is you know you have to have a sense of like uh, this okay this is this is good this isn't so good this is what we need to work on etc but they are very different roles right right well it sounds like a really cool career path you took and especially this last role <laughs> transitioning into your own business to help others is really cool so uh, and how long have you been doing that been about nine months now so tell us what is your week like in this new role well let's take this week um, <laughs> I had two book proposals to review so these are clients who are paying me a fee to review their book proposals and give them my feedback on it so I did that uh, I had another proposal that I'm that I'm preparing to shop to publishers. So I also do some literary agent work. And the literary agents serve as an inter intermediary between authors and publishers. So they will take an author's book proposal and pitch it to various publishers in hopes of getting some interest and in making a deal happen. And then the, the literary agent gets a commission off of a deal if one 
happen. So I had a proposal that I worked on to prepare for that process. Uh, I worked on a blog post this week, and I worked on a what, what I'm calling a book proposal template. I've never I've created book proposal guidelines, but I've never created a template that somebody mm -hmm. could. It's kind of like a fill in the blank document, you know, for creating a book proposal. So I I worked on that this week, and we'll be uh, unveiling that here shortly. So um, and then Fridays are when I do my when I do all my calls and meetings. Uh, which is when we happen to be talking. And um, so that's been my week. No, that's great. A book proposal is daunting because it is a lot of information. <laughs> so having a template out there, I see how that could be very beneficial to first-time authors. I hope so. That's the whole point, is to help make it a little less stressful, a little more doable. How would you define the book publishing industry as a whole? Like, is it healthy? Is it going through some struggles with different forms for folks to get their message out? Well, it's certainly went through a disruption with the advent of ebooks, but that's been probably 10 years or more ago now. I, w I would say the book publishing industry is an old industry. It's very stable. There's not a lot of rapid growth. You know, you see books kind of jump out, individual books that jump out and make a stir. But for the most part, individual publisher, there aren't, you know, it's, it's rare that you'll see a publisher that is just growing leaps and bounds like a, like a startup would. That's because this is a very old industry. Having said that, it's, I think, a, a quite stable industry, and I, I don't think it was disrupted to the extent that the music industry was disrupted mm. Disrupted when, um, when iTunes came out and people started listening digitally. I think pu book publishers, traditional book publishers, still offer a lot of value in the publishing process. Things like editing, marketing, publicity, design, all of those services add real value to the process, which hopefully, I mean, for the sake of the industry, assures publishers that they'll have a place in the process. Now, self-publishing is bigger than ever, and there are lots of, uh, you know, I'm a fan of both self-publishing and traditional publishing. It just depends on what your goals are for your particular project. Um, but certainly that has been a massive shift in the whole publishing industry is the advent and growth of self-publishing. So, I don't know, those are some thoughts for you. Right, <laughs> right. As a reminder, you can check out all previous episodes at learnfromothers.org. If you are an educator or a student, you can search for podcasts by career cluster and additional resources are under the resource tab. So, Chad, we just learned what you wanted to be when you grew up, which was an astronaut, and what you're actually mm -hmm. doing today. And how did you phrase that? You are a writing coach? Writing coach, yeah. So, if you could do it all over again, what would you do differently? That's a great question. I think maybe I would have made the transition to full-time self-employed writing coach a little sooner mm -hmm. you know it's a big risk when you when you decide to go out on your own and you have a mortgage and a family and kids and so on it is a risk but life is full of is full of risks and so I guess I wish I I wouldn't have waited as long as I did to make that transition. It's not like I wish I would have done it five years earlier, maybe just a year or two earlier, you know. Right. That would be my answer to your question. Yeah, that is a big jump to go from the security of a company to your own. So that's great that you made it, even though it might not have been as soon as you wanted. It sounds like it's working out great. Well, let's make the assumption that someone in our audience wants to do what you do to be a writing coach. What advice would you give them? Is there a typical career path? I would say it starts with reading a lot and uh, reading carefully and uh, critically, and also writing a lot, getting a sense for language and, and what one can do with it and uh, what the limits of it are. And to fall in love with books uh, is probably the first, the first step, and to, to read a lot and to write a lot. I think pursuing a career as an editor uh, in one form or another is is a great way to go. Uh, I suppose another another possible way into what I'm doing is becoming a teacher, you know, a, like an English teacher, and then maybe using that as a springboard into becoming a writing coach. It just feels like, you know, you need to be in an industry where you're working with writers, and I think it's helpful. I think it's helpful to be in an industry that where you're where you are learning about publishing. I guess that would be my advice. Fall in love with books, read a lot, write a lot, you know, and then get into some sort of career path that allows you to work with writers. 
And becoming an editor for a book publisher is not a bad way of going. I mean, I guess you could also work for a magazine publisher, something like that. It just depends on your interests, sort of where you want to specialize. But then after you've done that for a while and you start, you start getting your own voice out there, to build a business as a writing coach, a self-employed, full-time writing coach, you, you have to build your own audience. They don't just come to you. And so starting a blog, I think, or a podcast is a great way to do that. Uh, it's an amazing thing about the world we live in today. You know, just 30 years ago, we didn't have access to the millions of people we have access to now just because we have an Internet connection. So that's a bit circuitous, but hopefully that's a helpful uh, way of describing how to how to end up in this field. Yeah, that's great. And actually, I do have a specific question as it relates to editing. Now, in today's world, do you find that folks are using their own vernacular as their voice for writing, which may not be grammatically correct? And if so, what do you do as an editor? <laughs> First of all, there are different kinds of writing. There's more formal uh, types of writing. There's more casual types of writing. In any trade book you pick up today, especially if it's published recently, it's probably going to be a little more casual than people read you know, 50 years ago. So the point is communication and for the writing to not, uh, to avoid getting in the way of that communication. In other words, you want the writing to facilitate an experience. Mm -hmm. And as long as the writing is doing that, that's the main thing. And, and so there are generally accepted conventions of the English language, which if you violate, kind of get in the way of storytelling and communication. Right. Right. But then but then sometimes you can violate those conventions in a way that actually has a great effect. You've got to keep the, the main objective in mind and, and let that steer you forward. I don't know. That's a very that's a very nebulous answer. But the main thing is that it's all about communication. Well, the, are there any current projects you're working on that you would like to share? Well, if any of your listeners are writers, uh, if they have a book that's inside them that they want to get into the world or if they're just interested in what it looks like to be a writing coach, I invite them to come to my blog, which is chadrallen.com. Awesome. Great. Yeah. And I know you have a lot of good stuff on your website there. So there's a lot of research and they can do just by discovering you and what you're doing out there. So that's great. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, as with most journeys, success largely depends on reliable transportation. And I'm a huge car enthusiast. So could you tell us what was your first car? My first car. Get this was a 68, <laughs> a 68 Ford Mustang. Get out. That was my first car. Really? Yeah. What was yours like? It was a turquoise at a heart. It wasn't a convertible, and it was uh, turquoise, and my grandparents gave it to me as a high school graduation present. Wow. Was it a V8 or a 6? Six? 6. Was it three-speed or automatic? Three-speed. Mine was the same, except it was red. Was yours far from airtight? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like passed out from the exhaust leak coming through the dash <laughs> about passed out. So I finally sold it at auction because as much as I loved it, it just wasn't practical enough. No, because the, the, the wind would just come through the window. Yes. So, you know, but, but I love that car. <laughs> that was awesome. Well, uh, what's your dream car? I would love someday and I don't even care which which particular model, but I would love someday to own a Tesla. OK, sure. Yeah, those are super cool and actually super fast and super fuel efficient. So they and super pretty. So they're great cars. <laughs> 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 well, that's awesome. Well, one great perk to some jobs is having a company car. So if I had all the money in the world, I'd love to buy you a company car based on your job. And I had a lot of fun with this one, actually more fun than I thought. So what I did was, is I just, I researched what cars have anything to do with writing in them. <laughs> what book mentions a cool car? And I just couldn't think of one. And so I started Googling and I went with the most iconic movie ever, Citizen Kane. Mm. And I picked a, I picked the car from that movie and so the car for you I picked out is a 1924 Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost. Are you familiar with this car at all? An image appears in my imagination as you say it. It's a stunning car because it's beautiful. Yes. Yeah, you probably are right on. So what's interesting about this car, it is, it's even cooler than I thought. So when I started researching the Silver Ghost, some of them were silver, yes, but they were silver because they used aluminum paint like the aluminum was in the paint so i always wondered why were they called silver ghosts if they weren't silver but one thing that was interesting is they were so reliable and so smooth that they were said to waft through the countryside so i thought oh great there's a word involved here and the engineers at rolls royce actually coined the word 
waved ability. <laughs> and that, <laughs> apparently that that word doesn't exist anymore. But back in 1924, waved ability was a thing. So I thought you would appreciate that. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. Well, I'll take it. I'll take it. That All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you like the Silver Ghost. So, well, thank you so much for taking us on your career journey today. What's the best way our listeners can learn more about you and your company? Yeah, chadrallen.com. Would love you to, to come check us out. And shoot, you know, you can do the way to shoot me an email through the, through the blog. I'd love to hear from anybody. Awesome. Well, thanks, Chad, for taking us on your career journey today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Learn From Others, where we help others succeed by sharing success. Where will our next adventure take us? Subscribe to find out. If you know of someone who has a cool career story or occupation, contact Greg through Instagram at Greg Stanley LFO. That's G-R-E-G-S-T-A-N-L-E-Y-L-F-O. And we will see you soon as we learn from others together.